Ian Thompson, The Soul of Basketball, uh, ESPN, Sports Illustrated, NBA.com joins us. And welcome back to the show. Pleasure to have you, my man. Hello, good to be with you, Martin. Thanks. Tomorrow we're underway, the NBA Finals. Look, I'm 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 excited. I've been watching the playoffs uh, virtually, or you know, a little bit of pretty much most games, and I've watched all of the all of the, all the conference finals, like I'm sure that you have. But is this a reasonably unattractive final for the NBA with Miami, the eighth seed, and Denver in a market that doesn't really care that much about it? You know, about 30 years ago, it would have been a great series for the NBA, uh, but then they went mainstream, right? They turned it into an entertainment industry, and now it's really lacking in star power. So for the basketball junkies like you and me, people who just love the matchups and the drama of the sport itself, it's fantastic, I think, Um, with real questions on both sides. I think Denver's got more strengths than Miami, and it's going to be a tough matchup for Miami in a certain spot, but... It's, it's going to be uh, terrific for the basketball. But as an entertainment, you know, there's sort of, in, in the States, there's sort of like, uh, who really cares? You know, uh, for the mainstream sports fan, it doesn't really pay a lot of attention. It's not LeBron. If it's not Steph Curry, why are we watching? That's, that's kind of not the Celtics, uh, you know, not Billy. I don't know. People are, I think people are looking at this as a glass half full here. Well, when we spoke to you um, weeks and weeks ago to start with, you predicted a Celtics-Denver NBA final. So you just about got it right. Yeah, except I really got it wrong with Boston and everybody, everybody did. You know, just assuming too much with them. And I think what it came down to was um, a, not realizing the importance of coaching, just taking for granted uh, you see all the great coaches that go far in the in the playoffs, and uh, you realize the Celtics were putting out uh, a 34-year-old rookie who was younger than one of his players, uh, who had zero experience, uh, Joe Mazzulla, the, the new head coach of the Celtics. Um, they hired him right before training camp, you know, when they had to get rid of their old coach, and um, he, he had no experience voices around him on his coaching staff, which really, in hindsight, you know, I I didn't see the importance of it in advance, but the Celtics surely must have. They, they, this is a mind boggling mistake by the front office to not recognize that he would need some experienced voices sitting behind him to help guide him and to help him coach. I mean, even Phil, the great Phil Jackson, always had one or two older hands around him to help guide him. And that was Phil Jackson, who's arguably the greatest coach in the history of the league. So I I don't understand how the Celtics front office could have been so derelict as to put a guy who wasn't equipped to coach them to a championship, to put him in charge without giving him any help. So I really think coaching is what, what it came down to in the end for the Celtics. When they came out for the seventh game, they look very, very nervous to me. And they look like somebody that's going to have to take an oral exam and hasn't read the book. And they just they, they just froze. They, they forgot how to play. The moment was too big for them. It was like deep down they knew they weren't ready for it. And that's all coaching. I mean, it's all coaching. So they get the right people around him next year. Maybe they'll be right back at it with the same team because that might be all it takes. In the meantime, we have uh, Miami and Denver. And, and again, I, I, I think in terms of basketball, it's going to be really interesting. Ian Thompson is with us, author of The Soul of Basketball, former Sports Illustrated, NBA.com. This is the platform. All right, so, you know, I was watching Spole the other day and I thought he was so impressive after game six. I mean, he's sitting there on the podium and he's saying, we want to play right now. This dressing room wants to play. We want to start game seven right now. He seems so positive. He seems so upbeat. I know there's a lot of psychology that goes with that. But now the ultimate test, how does he... How how does he outcoach Malone? How does he? What weaknesses can he exploit in that in that Denver side? I mean, it's a great point. You really saw who he was and and what he stood for, and how much he's gained over the decades to being uh, working alongside Pat Riley. I mean, that's exactly what Pat Riley would have done. Going back to the fifties and sixties, that's what Red Auerbach would have done. I mean. Um, uh, he 
he was using the press conference to speak to his players, which is what the great coaches do. Um, they're not speaking to us. They're speaking to the players. Uh, another failing by the, the Boston coach, Joe Mazzulli, who just didn't know better. Um, for him to for him to get uh, Miami, uh, for him to make this a close series that they can steal at the end of the games, he's got to find some way to defend uh, Nikola Jokic. And I'm sure it's going to involve zone defenses and mixing up defenses uh, and trying to surprise Jokic. But in terms of man-to-man coverage, when they have to play man defense, I just don't know who's going to be able to guard him. Uh, uh, Bam Adebayo is giving up a lot of size to Jokic. And Jokic does not use athleticism to beat guys. I mean, he's got a great first step and everything, but he's not going to rise above you, and he doesn't have to. He's won two MVPs and led his team now to the finals without being the typical athlete, you know, not the Will Chamberlain, not the Bill Russell type, not even the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar level of athleticism. He's, he does it. He does it by understanding the game and understanding when he has an advantage, and he can take that first step to get by you. And as, as long as he's a couple of inches past you, now he's got all the leverage. He's got those wide shoulders and the strength, and he's seeing the game so far ahead of everybody else. Um, the last guy I've seen playing like this was Bill Walton, you know, four decades ago for the Portland Trailblazers. The last time a team ran their offense through a center like this. So it all, it all runs through him. He stands, he stands uh, above the free throw line and uh, they give him the ball and he holds it up over his head where no one else can get it. And his teammates just run circles around him like the roundabout or like a merry-go-round at the museum or at the, at the carnival, I should say. Uh, they just run cir- have circles around him, and he decides, okay, you get the ball this time, and that guy gets a layup, or you get the ball this time, and that guy gets an open jump shot. And he's just amazing. No one else in the NBA plays like Denver because of Jokic. They're, they're, they're unique in the league, and good luck to Spolstra, but the whole game plan is going to revolve around trying to stop this guy that they can't stop individually. They're going to have to try to do it with junk defenses and team defenses. The the sheer emotion that Miami are riding, uh, given the fact that last year they're the top seed, they lost in the Eastern Conference game seven to Boston. This year they they lose their first play in game, then they're down in the fourth quarter against Chicago. They claw their way back. I mean they've had a fantastic playoff series and so forth. But how you know how long can you be on that train? How long can you be right you know riding the you know Jimmy Buckets thing and and and. Or, 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 or does it just come down to the absolute nuts and bolts of who's got a better team, who's got a better system, and Denver can grind you down? I, I think it's the latter. I mean, they can go, all, go as long as it's going well. And then when they run into a superior team, which is what they're running into now, and it's a team in the truest sense, and that's, that's going to be what's going to hurt Miami. I'm not saying it's mortal. Because at this point, you sh- we've all been saying Miami's going to lose every series, and you know they barely made the playoffs out of the play-in tournament. Um, so no one should be saying they don't have a chance. But this is this is going to be tough. They're, they're going to come in with the momentum and everything, and they're going to hope that Jimmy Butler can somehow basically do what he does better than Jokic does what he does. Um, but at the end of the day. Um, you know, both teams have a narrative in a way, you know, like Miami has that narrative and they have that momentum that's been driving them in, but Denver's got a narrative of their own. I mean, they, they've they never made an NBA Finals before. Um, they've got the best home court advantage because of the altitude of Denver, which is a mile high above sea level, and it just drains the oxygen out of the same players who aren't acclimated to it. Um, but they've never made an NBA Finals. Uh, and Jokic was a two-time MVP who earlier in the season, Martin, you may remember, a lot of American players were criticizing Jokic, saying that he was held to a different standard than the great American players, that he'd never done anything in the playoffs, and yet no one was criticizing the way the, the great American players get criticized, and saying that he wasn't worthy of a third MVP when I, I thought he was, personally. Um so they, they've got a narrative of their own. They, even though they've dominated the West all year, they see themselves as underdogs. Um, 
the team that everybody's overlooking that's always about their opponent, whether it's the Lakers or whoever they're playing in the playoffs. So I think both both teams view themselves as being on kind of a mission. And in the end, it's it's going to come down to the best two players and who's the most effective. Well, uh, I'm just sitting here listening to that, saying not in my head going, well, that's Jokic, isn't it? I mean, try and stop him. And it's look, it is, it, it's his work rate, Ian, that, that impresses me the most. I mean, he, he looks exhausted when he takes the court, doesn't he? But the consistency of the numbers that he puts up and the fact that he's so selfless with the rest of his team, like... You know, I know we love, look, it's all about the money shot these days and the Instagram and the posterizing dunk and all of that kind of stuff. And that, you know, that's good for the 30 second attention span. But to win a seven game series, you've got to turn up every single night and you've got to play 40 minutes. And that's what this guy does. And so that's why I hope that he wins, because to me, it's just a victory for basketball. Do you do you actually consider that as well? Oh, absolutely. I, I completely agree. It's it's. Uh... It's a victory over what really matters uh, versus what doesn't really matter. And all, all the highlights and the, the flash and the vertical leaping and all of that, um, that only matters if you're playing fundamental basketball. So LeBron, it's worked for LeBron because he plays fundamental basketball. It worked for Michael Jordan because he plays fundamentals. Steph Curry is true the fundamentals, as crazy as some of the shots are, uh, and the work he puts in on this game. Um, but a lot of these guys that are famous for playing basketball, they are not famous for winning. Jokic is much more famous for winning than he is for playing basketball. That might change now if they win the championship. Um, you know, he's going to have center stage, and I, I know the – I know the numbers might be down, the TV numbers, the, the audience numbers in the States, they might be down. But the people that really care are going to be watching, and they're going to know this. They're going to see uh, that probably, I think, that there's no answer to this guy. And they're going to put it together. He won two MVPs, and he was a second-round draft pick. And even when Denver picked him, they had no idea what they had. Uh, and they had a, a starting center ahead of him, and all of a sudden they traded that guy to Portland, Nurkic to Portland, because they realized, oh, my gosh, this guy is much better than anybody thought. And um, they've, they've just grown around him, and they've had a bunch of frustrating times in the playoffs. But now, now this year it's come together. They've been the best team all year long. Um, last time we talked, Martin, we talked about teams that, that – sort of dilly-dally during the season and think that they can figure it out later. Um, Denver was not that. Dem Denver was playing hard all season. They, they played with humility that way. And, um, and, you know, Miami didn't flip a switch either. I think Miami was trying all year. They just struggled. They, but I don't see a Miami team ever relaxing during the season and thinking they can figure it out later. I think all the hard work Miami put in during the season has paid off during the playoffs as well in their own way. So you have two very hardworking teams, but ultimately I, I just think this is going to be a showcase for Jokic and for fundamental basketball, as you say, and that the people who care about the right things in basketball, the fundamentals of basketball, this is going to be a bit of a parade for them to watch them.